Taming the Machines that Rule Our Lives. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Ben Pring, author, futurist, and the director of the Center for the Future of Work at Cognizant. Welcome, Ben. Hi, Tanya. Great to be with you. What kind of work does the Center for the Future of Work do? Well, we're a, a group within Cognizant, which is a big technology services company, about 300,000 people around the world, which really has a charter to look at leading edge technology, leading edge business issues, and how our clients, the people we work with, can take advantage of this incredibly powerful technology that is kind of changing the world at the moment. You and your co-author, Dr. Paul Rorig, just released a new book cleverly titled Monster, a tough love letter on taming the machines that rule our jobs, lives, and future. What drove you both uh, to write this book? Well, Paul and I have worked in technology all our lives, more years than we care to remember. And we've been sort of evangelists for leading edge technology. We go into uh, events and out on the road and talk about how uh, we can take advantage of uh, cloud computing and algorithms and big data and things like that. So we're kind of in love with technology. But as we've been doing that the last few years, we've, we've noticed that more and more people are kind of worried about and concerned about the very real downside of a lot of this leading edge technology. Uh, people are worried about the role of automation and AI on their jobs. People are worried about social media and what it's sort of doing to their kids and what it's doing to civil society. And as we sort of um, started thinking about that, it became more and more apparent to us that really the, not any single one technology, but the combination of a lot of these leading edge technologies and the way that we're using them is sort of increasingly producing this monstrous outcome. It's taking technology in a direction that we don't like, that we don't feel comfortable with. And rather than running away from that and thinking, oh gosh, that's too kind of controversial, we don't want to talk about that, we thought it behooved us as people who, as I say, like technology, love technology, have a vested interest in keeping technology in a good place to sort of look at that downside, that dark underbelly, and, and provide some advice and recommendations and guidance on how we can make sure that technology doesn't go, you know, continue to go in that dark direction, but it, it stays in a good place, you know, hashtag tech for good. So that's really our thinking here is the, let's provide some, some, some ideas on how we can keep technology in a good place and, and hopefully all continue to benefit from it. When and how did our tech turn monstrous? Was there a pivotal moment? I don't think there's any one moment, Tanya. I think it's a, a cumulative thing. And in the context of a kind of exponential curve, it was happening gradually, slowly, gradually, and then it sort of went bang. And I think the real moment of bang is the combination of social media on, on cell phones. Um, you know, back in 2007, 2008, I think there were about um, 2 million people on Facebook. You know, fast forward today, there's almost 3 billion people on Facebook. So that combination, having the access to social media and the sort of addictive nature of it in the palm of your hand the whole time, I think that's really where this uh, kind of rabbit hole that we've gone down uh, begins, uh, begins from. I think that's the point you can sort of really uh, age it to, if you like. You refer to Monster as a deliberately short book. What does that say about technology's effect on our attention span? Yeah, again, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the, the last few books we've written have all been 65,000 words, 70,000 words. This is 30,000. Uh, so you can read it in a couple of hours. And yeah, I think we, we, again, we steered into the reality of the modern world that we all have attention deficit dis disorder. We're all looking at multiple screens all day. There's competing demands on our time and our attention. So rather than kind of trying to, you know, force people to sit down and read something over hours and hours, we've designed this book to be in tune with uh, the modern age. You can read it very quickly and you can kind of get the, the message and the recommendations in a, in a single reading, really. We talk about this often in my interviews. For, for most of humanity's existence, we've measured change in centuries and decades. Now we measure it in quarters or software release cycles. Are humans wired to cope with change at this pace? No, that's a great question. And I think that's the, the crux in a way of this issue is that uh, 
our operating system is 70,000 years old. And like you say, the operating system of a new app or a new computer or a new uh, phone is months old and it's changing much more quickly than our ability to absorb it and to adapt to it. And I think that disconnect, that tension, if you like, between those two kind of curves of development really explains a lot of, of what's going on at an individual level, at a societal level, at a sort of geopolitical level. Um, there's a lovely quote from the Prime Minister of, um, Justin, uh, of, of Canada, Justin Trudeau, who said a couple of years ago that the pace of change has never been this fast, yet it'll never be this slow again. And, and if you're a techie, nerdy person, that's kind of exciting. We're building the science fiction world that we've seen in the movies. But if you're a kind of ordinary, regular civilian in, uh, uh, you know, not really involved in all of this, it feels like the world is skating away from you. And I can't help thinking that if you live in a zip code full of code, this is probably the most exciting time to, to be alive. But if you live in an analog zip code, if you live in a, an analog world, then you know putting up walls and uh, disconnecting yourself from the modern world, that seems like a reasonable response to something that doesn't seem to be really involving you and, and is increasingly kind of a threat to who you are, your identity, your way of life. So let's expand on that. Ultimately, each of us played a role in creating the tech monster, right? So talk about our individual roles in containing it and guiding it. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And we certainly don't point fingers solely at any of the technology companies and say, you know, bad tech, tech company or bad tech executive. It's much more sophisticated and nuanced and complex than that, this issue. And you're absolutely right. We all individually vote with our fingers all the time. We're, 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 we're sort of voting to be in this world all of the time. So I think the, the way that we uh, deal with this issue isn't just government regulation, it isn't just heavy handed sort of top down um, thinking, it is very much individual bottoms up thinking and, and, and in the book we have all sorts of thoughts about how we as individuals can break this addiction, how we can uh, perhaps go off, you know, go offline. And, um, when we started writing this a few years ago, this book, that seemed like a crazy idea. But I'd, I'd say if, if you look at the news right now, you see every day of the week, celebrities, sports stars, the English Premier League teams in the UK, where I come from originally last week, all went off social media. Uh, the UK government has just announced uh, legislation in the last couple of days to try and break this addiction, break this spell. And to, to uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that this technology can be really powerful and really great, but too much of a good thing is not necessarily a good thing. And so individually, I think we need to uh, you know, focus more on that ability to walk away from this, this tech, put it down, uh, take that digital Sabbath understand that the, the world isn't simply the world that you see on, on this screen, the screen you're looking at, but it's the world outside that window that you're looking through as well. Um, so no, it's going to be a complicated thing. It's, it's not going to be easy in a way, taming this monster and getting it into the, the place where it should be in our society. But I think we've got to make a start and um, we've got to start talking about that. Ben Pring, author, futurist, and director of the Center for the Future of Work at Cognizant. Thanks for taking some time to talk about your book. If somebody wants to connect with you, Ben, maybe they want to get a copy of your book. How can they do that? Well, thanks, Tony. Great talking to you as well. And uh, well, all, ro all roads ironically lead to uh, Twitter. So I'm at Benjamin Pring at Twitter, and you can find me there. Thanks again, Ben. Thank and you. find and subscribe to more of my interviews right here on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.